Amen. Maybe see you this morning. Well, this was the day that we were going to be outside for our one service, but uh, man, we're not. How about that rain last night? Man. So um, here we are, and uh, I'm glad. I'm glad we're together today. We will work toward having a one service at some point because I can't wait for us to all see all of us all together at the same time. Uh, You think about on any given Sunday, there's 400 people here in the two services. I can't wait for us to all see each other together at the same time. There's 100 plus kids upstairs uh, in our children's ministry every Sunday. And so you just imagine all of us and all of them all together at the same time. I'm looking forward to that. Um, You know, it's interesting uh, being part of the church. I've been a part of the church since 1981. I was saved and active in church uh, in the mid-80s, called into ministry. So I I have given my life to the work of the church. And honestly, there's been some of my best days have been in the church. Honestly, some of my worst days have been in the church. I've been on both sides of it. And um, I've, I've, I've been through deep hurt. I've been through times when all I could do is just go home and just weep in my chair and uh, have Heather sit beside me because the times were so difficult, so painful. But there's been other times that have been the times of incredible rejoicing at what God has done. And uh, those best days are these days right here, what God is doing at Vertical. To hear stories like Lauren's this morning, uh, just continue ongoing stories of Dear Vertical. Here's what God has done and is doing in my life. Those stories are powerful. And um, so I get it when people say, at eh, church, I don't know, I've, it's painful, too awkward, too weird. I get it. I've been there. I've been a part of all that. I've done some of that. I'm done with all that, though. Amen? And, you know, I watch movement among people today who are believers. There's an interesting movement happening um, among Christians. Some people have been leaving what have been non-denominational church, mm, contemporary style church, and are going back into like Presbyterian, Presbyterian, high church, some even leaving the church and going back into Catholicism. And it's just interesting to watch some of that happen. And uh, Truett and I have had a lot of discussions about that as to why. Why is that happening? And I think uh, watching a little bit of church history, it kind of makes sense. Here, See if you don't track along with this with me. So back in the 80s and 90s, if you followed church any and early 2000s, there began to be this movement among churches where church began to be more about kind of like a show up front. And there was this plastic, you know, put on the show, be cool, uh, kind of drop the, um, drop the expectations and be whatever the community needed you to be. And so the message began to be very diluted and it was very simple, and which is cool. But the church, I think, overall began to struggle with that because if all you feed people is just milk, then they just remain babies, right? And so I think the church as a whole began to stop feeding meat to the believers, and they became weak. And I think what we're seeing today is some of a reaction to that where people are saying, I'm tired of the show. I'm ready for something genuine and sincere and I want some depth, and I want something that's real. Does that track with everybody here? You, you see that? And so I think we've seen some of the opposite here at Vertical. I think what we are seeing is not people leaving and going to some of those places, but we're seeing people come to our church who have come out of church experiences that have been less than life-giving. Amen? Amen. Um, because it is our goal here. It has been from day one. Let's lift him up, but let's live him out. Let's be real, you know? Let's talk about real issues. Let's meet Jesus in very real places. Let's not pull back. Let's not hide. Let's not sugarcoat. And, you know, some of that you strategize and think, is that really going to bring a lot of people in? I mean, God has blessed. 
Amen? And it's based on his promises. You lift him up and you lift him out and do what he says, he will draw all people to himself. So I think that's what is happening here, but it just drives the importance of this day and this time of genuineness, of sincerity. People want real. They don't want you to put on a fake show, put on a false front. They don't want to see the pastor saying one thing on a Sunday morning and see him sit in a bar on Sunday night, right? You don't want to see, you know, the, the guy that's leading the Bible study or the woman that's leading the Bible study saying one thing in a Bible study but living a life that is absolute contrary to everything they're talking about, I think people are getting tired of compartmentalization like that. They're getting tired of the fake. They're getting tired of the show, and they want real. So that has been our goal because I'm, I'm confident that's what God blesses. He blesses people who are genuine, who are real. Jesus had some hard things to say to some people, and the hardest things he said were to the people who were less than genuine. They were pretentious. They put on. They were fake. He called them hypocrites. And Jesus did not hold anything back. I mean, you're just, you read some of the New Testament, the Gospels with Jesus' conversation with some of those people, and you just think, oh, man, that would have been just awkward being there in that moment because of the things that Jesus said to them. But I'm convinced that's the kind of thing God blesses is when there is genuine, real faith and life. And when that happens here, there's power in that. When people stop feeling like they have to pretend here or put on here or impress, where there's just genuine, I am who I am and I'm seeking the Lord and I am not ashamed of that. That's real. And when that real matches what's real in you, you truly being genuine with God, say, God, I I don't want to hold anything back from you. I'm real. I'm not going to pretend to put on. You see everything. You know everything. And you have a purpose for my life. And that's real. And when that real matches this real, and it goes home with you and it's real, God will multiply blessings upon you. When you are real here, real here, and when you take it home and it's real. When what you say and what you believe comes out in your home, and it shows up in the way you talk, in the way you choose your habits and your lifestyle, and all of that matches, and there's just consistency. You're the same here, same there, same at work. When you're the same, God blesses that kind of real. That's what's real. That's what's genuine. And so being real matters in all of those areas. It, it's really what what Joshua said in the passage has kind of framed this series for us. Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. All three are there. As for me, as for my house, we will serve the Lord. Here in my house, we'll serve the Lord. All three are there, and there's consistency in that. And this is what real family does. This is what real people do. They match in all three. Now, I'll say what I've said every week. I'm going to keep saying it in this series. I don't want anyone to think that when I say family that I'm talking only about a husband, a wife, and some number of children who are high school and down. That is a family, but in this room and in this church, are families of all kinds, amen? There are people who are married and no children. There are people who are not married and don't have any kids. There are people who are married, were married, not married, and have kids. There are people who were married, not married, married again, have multiple kids between them. There's all kind of family groups in here, amen? And every one of them counts, Every one of them is important. Every one of them is essential. So please, do not let the enemy steal away his word because you have thought somehow you don't fit. Every house matters. Every house matters. But today I want us to think about this idea of the church and why it's important to be engaged and involved in a church. 
because Jesus is the one who built it. Jesus is the one who's building it, and he has a certain blessing he has poured out on it. So our message title today is Families Grow Best in Church. Families Grow Best in a Healthy Church. Hello? I know a lot of families who are involved in a church, and if your church is not healthy, it's not going to help you have a healthy family. Amen? I'm not trying to be arrogant or anything, but it's just true from Scripture. I mean, you just read it. You just read Book of Revelation and what Jesus says to seven churches there at the beginning of that whole book. There, it is important that you have a healthy church that you're engaged in and involved in. God blesses families who are engaged, whatever your family is. There are lessons that are intended for us to learn that you can't get anywhere else. You won't get it at the best training from where you work. You won't get it in the best college setting. You even won't get it through some online podcast or course that you might take. There are some lessons that God has for us that can only be experienced and learned when you are engaged and involved in a local church. So we're going to look at those today, eight powerful blessings and lessons that are necessary for you and me as we grow in our faith and grow in being a part of the church. So take notes. Here we go. You're welcome to use your phone to take notes on the, or take a picture of the screen as we go along. Your first one is this. Church is where we discover real belonging. Now I know that people are hungry for this. People want to know they matter. People want to know that they belong. People want to know that they fit in. People like being a part of a group. People like knowing I have something that is significant. I want to stand with a group that is going somewhere and doing something. It's really part of why we all like some sports teams. Hello? It's true. You pick your sports team and you stick with them, and man, when they're doing good, you just feel like, you feel like you're part of the team, even though you don't get a paycheck from them at all. Hello? But man, it just feels good wearing a Texas Ranger cap these days. Hello? I mean, it always has, but there's something about today, it's just a little bit different. And so it matters. And Jesus created the church so that you and I would know belonging on a different scale. Because you can belong in a family. You can get some belonging with a friend group you have. You can get some belonging even by joining some social media group or friends and choosing your friend group out there. You can get some of that, but only in the church do you get this real sense of, I belong. I fit. I am part of something glorious. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 says this. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fit together, grows into the holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Wow. When you came to faith in Jesus Christ, you were made part of the church. Now, it has to be your intentional choice to get engaged and involved in a local church and then be a part It is there you will discover, hey, I am no longer on the outs with God. I'm on the ends with Jesus. Amen? He placed me. He's equipped me. He's at work in me. And I belong here. I fit here. He is at work in me here. He is changing me here. And I need the other parts of the body. Nobody should be a solo player. I'm not a solo player. I need the other parts of the body. I need my wife. I need my family. I need our church staff. I need this whole group here. Because I, it's an interesting thing what God has done. He's created us to have all that we need in Jesus alone. But he has also made us where I can exist 
without other people in my life. It's true. And both of those are true at the same time. I have everything I need in Jesus. But boy, I sure need everybody around me to help me in this process. I do. I, you can ask our staff. When we get together for our staff meetings each week, I do not come in and say, all right, here's what we're doing. That doesn't happen. I will say, I believe this is where God may be leading us. Let's talk about this. And sometimes our staff meetings take a while because I'm looking for the voice in the room. I want staff to talk to me. I want us to talk together. And it's not always my way that goes forward. And I'm glad for that. There's been some decisions that I thought we should have done that now we all look back and laugh at and say, man, I'm glad we didn't do that. And there were some things I did say we should do this and the staff still laughs at me because we did it. And it was an epic fail. Some of those things happen. I need, you need, we all need other people in our life. And that kind of belonging can only happen in the church where you come together and God shapes us, connects us, and we need one another. And I know what happens is the enemy loves this little space right here that we're talking about. Because he likes to get in there and say, oh, he's talking to everybody but you. Because you're too broken, too weird, don't fit, not like everybody else. And the enemy will go to town on any one of us if we let him. But here's what I know. 1 Corinthians 12 says that even the members in the body that are the smallest and perhaps seemingly insignificant are some of the most valuable members of the body. It's true in our physical body. If you saw the size of your spleen, you might think that is insignificant. But you try operating without one, there are going to be some issues. Hello? I had my gallbladder removed years ago. I had some issues going on. I wish I still had that dude. Because <laughs> it still causes some issues. Hello? Right? It's true. Every one of us, if you have been redeemed, you have been placed in the church, do not let the enemy ever convince you your story doesn't matter, your gifts don't matter, your life doesn't matter, that you're not like anybody else. If you're not like everybody else, great, we need you. We need you in the body. Well, but I just, my gifts are different than other people's. Great! I don't want to have to use my big toe for an ear. I need my ear to be an ear. Hello? Every member in the body is important. If he has called you and placed you, then don't let the enemy convince you of anything else. You belong. You matter. And only in the church can you truly know that and learn that lesson. The second one. Church is where we understand real family. Our world today is caving at breakneck speed, and the foundations of culture are being just rapidly dissolved. There's going to come a day when they will crash and burn. I don't mean in hell, but even here. When the culture is going to one day wake up and say, what have we done? Where are the foundations, and how do we begin to rebuild this thing? This is going to be one of those moments when that happens, when the church will say, me, 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 call on me. I know, I know the answer. I know the answer. Because we do. We have been given not just an answer. We have the answer to the foundation of this culture and this society. Family comes from Scripture. All of the roles of a family are found and rooted in the Scripture. The idea of a father comes from the Bible. That wasn't just some guy's idea one day. God addresses himself as father, and he shows us what that means. It's only in the scripture that we learn that we are sons and daughters of this father. 
All of the concepts of son and daughter come from Scripture. Even the idea of siblings come from Scripture. Did you know that Jesus is not only your Lord, he's not only master and head of the church, the Bible also says that Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. That means you have an older brother and his name is Jesus. All of those concepts of family come from Scripture. And that's why it's so important that you and I understand them from a biblical basis, not from what the world has distorted and perverted. The whole idea of even adoption comes from Scripture. You and I have been adopted into the family of God. All of the principles for a successful marriage come from Scripture. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loves the church. Wives, love your husband in the same way the church loves Jesus. Older women teaching the younger women. Older men teaching the younger men. The younger sharing with those who are older. All of those relational concepts come from the Bible. And we are called as the church to know these, live these, because the world will one day need them. And you and I have been called to them. Amen? Number three, church is where we learn real relationship perspective. It's important that you know how to relate to the people in your life. And the Bible is the place where you learn the most powerful skills for this. In the church, we learn this. In Colossians 3.11, it says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or non uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. In a healthy church, there's no separation because of race, social status, marital status, family size, skin color, financial status, educational status, career choice, city, age, or any other background. When you walk into the church, there is a flat line equality amongst all of us. Amen? Amen. There's no class where you have to look up to certain people because they're better than you or look down on anyone because they're not where you are. In Christ, there is this in all and we are with all. Amen? Yes. This is a level of equality the world is trying to discover today. They've perverted it, and they call it equity, social equity, and they've got it all turned upside down. We've already known all this stuff inside the church, and healthy churches practice it. You don't come in parading the amount of money you make. Amen? You don't come in parading your race. You don't come in parading your job. You don't come in parading your accomplishments. You don't come in parading your failures. You come in championing Jesus Christ, and it puts everybody at the table. Amen? That's what I, I love what happens in here. I love what happens beyond here also in our groups in our church. I get to see some of those, whether it's our men's Bible study there's one on Wednesday morning. There's one on Monday night. There's a ladies' Bible study on Monday night. There's one on Thursday morning. There's, there's groups that meet in our church outside of this. And here's what I know. When they gather, they're sitting at tables often or in a living room, and everybody has a voice in that space. And you've got the older talking to the younger, the younger talking to the older You've got those new in Christ talking to those who have been with Christ for some time and vice versa. You've got people across the spectrum all sitting and talking as though none of that matters. Isn't that beautiful? This is what we have in Christ. And you can't learn those lessons anywhere else like you can in the church. Oh, if you work somewhere today, they're attempting to impress some rules upon you. Hello? All kind of diversity and equity and inclusivity, and you know it's not working. But in the church, in Christ, 
For those who get engaged at that level, it always works. When you are walking it out in true humility, this is what happens in the church. And only in the church can you learn that kind of relational perspective. And that's so healthy. It's healthy for adults. It's healthy for teenagers. It's healthy for children today to learn these valuable skills. The next one, the church is where we learn humility, worth, and purpose. You were placed in the body. And when you were placed in the body of Christ, you were given certain giftings. You might not know them yet. You might not be walking in the fullness of those yet. You might not be demonstrating those yet. But that is how you were placed in the body with a function and a purpose. And when you know that, it produces a deep humility in you that says, God, I don't deserve to be here at this table, but you, you rescued me and placed me here. And I am humbled by it. I accept my purpose in it, and I actually find my great worth in it. You talk about something that people outside the church just wish they had, a sense of purpose, I know why I exist, and a sense of worth. I mean, everybody runs around screaming, I'm worthy, I'm worthy. You're only worthy when you understand who Jesus Christ is in you. Amen? That's when you discover your worth. Listen to this passage from Romans. Paul said, to a church, speaks to us. For I say through the grace given to me, that to everyone who is among you, everyone, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all of the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that's been given to us, let us use them. Man, what good would your spleen be if it just said, hey, I just show up every once in a while. You know, I know I'm supposed to be here. Uh, I'm here to do my thing, but please don't ask too much of me. I'm just a small spleen, you know, really. I, I got time to show up here, but I got other stuff I'm doing, you know. Uh, so, just let me know. I'll show up just a little, and then I'm out. Hey, that spleen would be no good to you. Hello? And that spleen would not know its purpose. And that spleen would not know its worth to the entire body. And it, in itself, when you are placed in the body of Christ, you have a function and a role. You might not understand it yet. All the more reason to get engaged, to figure it out, to find it. Say, God, what is the purpose you have for me? I want to be in it. I want to do it because here, here you learn that in the activity, in the engagement. I could give you websites where you could go take spiritual gift profiles and you could click, 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 and they could spit out an answer at the end. I'm telling you, that kind of profile is meaningless. It's when you get engaged and you start interacting with people and you start letting God speak through you and them speak to you that you understand I know why I exist now. That's when you find your gift, when you do what you do in the body, when you get engaged in the body of Christ. Then it took me a while. When I was a younger believer, I was, I'd try all sorts of things. I'd serve in different areas to see, is this my gifting? No, that's definitely not my gifting. And there are other things that I thought, oh, that's sure not my gifting. Standing up in front of people and talking, that can't be my gifting because I'm not very good at it. It became actually my gifting. I would have never understood that had I not gotten engaged in the body and fulfilled the purpose that he called me to. This is where you learn that is within the context of church. And what a curious thing that God has done by making me completely independent, but at the same time, completely dependent upon the other body members. I need it, and that is where you learn your purpose. Listen, I'm not just talking about your purpose in church. I'm talking about your life purpose. 
You want to know why you exist? You want to know the bigger picture? It is meant to be discovered in the context of being a member of the body of Jesus. You're not going to go take some career choice software program or some online test and discover your life purpose. You will discover it as you seek the Lord and become active in the body of Christ. The next one. Church is where we experience God on a larger scale. It is true that you can experience God on your own. You can go out in the woods and take nobody with you but you and your Bible and pray and experience the wonders of God. You can. You can experience him in your car on the way to work, listening to some worship music. You can experience him in your living room, sitting there with a cup of coffee and your Bible, which sounds amazing. You can do all of that. But there is something different that happens when you gather with other believers at the same time. You know this. We all know this because we experience it here. There's just something different when we all gather together and people are using their gifts and people are giving their stories. In that moment, there's a different sense that God is in this space that's different than me just being at my house right? It's true. And what Jesus said is true. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. Do you have to get two or three people together before Jesus shows up in your midst? No. He's there with you. But you want an exponential version of Jesus showing up in the room? Get you two or three together in Jesus' name. Hello? And you get a group together like this, And we all have the same heart, same mind, seeking him, using our gifts, telling our stories, worshiping him, united in power and in purpose. No one's better than anybody else. We're all serving one another, serving the Lord in that space. That will be powerful. It's what's happened here. We We hear the stories of hearts changed, of habits broken, of restoration happening in relationships, healing happening. It all happens. It's happened here. And it happens differently because we've gathered for the purpose of experiencing God. It just works this way that Jesus has built the church so that when there are more gathered, there are greater demonstrations of God's hand at work. Amen? Church is also where we have our faith strengthened. I almost worded this one, church is where we learn about the faith. It is true. We do learn about the faith here, just like Caleb talked about. If it wasn't for a church, I would not have heard the gospel. I didn't go to the church because I wanted to hear the gospel. I went to the church because I was chasing a girl. But I heard the gospel, and then she left me. It needed to happen. Church is meant to be a place where we hear truth. But look here. You are meant to be one who seeks the Lord on your own. Please do not come here dependent upon me to be your faith provider. I I am here by what the scripture says to equip you to live out your faith. My goal is to help you understand the scripture, motivate you to the scripture, encourage you to Jesus so that when you walk out of here, you grow your faith. And the church has that role. I'm not your sole provider. He is. My role and the staff's role is to encourage you, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. He's worthy. He's good. His word is true. Here's what the Spirit of God sounds like. Here's how to walk in the Spirit. Here's how to trust Him in your life. Here's how to live it out. This is our role. Ephesians 4, 11, 13 says, And he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God 
to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Our role as staff is to help you keep maturing, keep growing, keep trusting, keep changing. I am not your pope. Thank you, Lord. Amen? I am not your go-between. I am not the way you get to God. And I am not the primary source of him getting to you. I'm just one guy doing my thing that I've been called to do in the body. Please don't treat me like I am some kind of pope, cardinal, that you can't be real with me. I'm a real guy. Ask my family. Ask the staff. And the best you can do for me is be real with me. Because if you come around and expect me to, or treat me like I'm the pope or cardinal or something, it just makes me feel weird. Like, bless you. I don't know what you want from me, you know? That's not my purpose. So the church is where you come to have your faith strengthened. The scripture's goal and my role is for every member to be independently strong in the Lord and interdependently strong as the church. If that happens, if you come here and your faith is strengthened, you say, I'm going back home and I'm going to study my Bible this week. Score! If you leave out of here and say, you know what? I like those songs. I'm going to find some more music like that and start listening because I like to worship the Lord. Score! If you walk out here and say, I want to bring my faith home. I want to talk about faith in my home. Score! We have done what we've been called to do. The next one. Church is where we know God's blessing and protection. Jesus made a promise, and he said to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. Now, what's interesting is that Peter's name in a play on words means rock. Catholic church interprets that as upon Peter, I will build my church, and therefore, that's why there are popes and cardinals and all of this. Jesus had this play there, but it wasn't on Peter. It was on the statement that Peter made. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. On that rock, Jesus says, I will build my church. On those who gather and say, you are the one. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. He says, where that happens, I will build my church. And here's what I promise. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. You can open up a portal to hell right out there on Old Villa Road and the demons can come flying out of there at full force and we can stand with confidence right here and say, Jesus is going to protect us because the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Amen? And when any church is standing with him and they're acknowledging him as the Christ, the son of the living God, you can count on that he will protect that church against any storm, against any attack, against any threat. And if I know a storm is coming, guess where I want to be? In a place that's safe. Hey, storm winds are blowing today. And I'm not just talking about a weather forecast. I'm talking about a spiritual forecast. There is demonic activity in our world today, and it is driving what is happening in media government, culture, and if, if you don't get a place where you are safe and secure, I cannot promise you, you won't be swept away by their forces. But when you get active and engaged within a local church, and you've got brothers and sisters standing alongside you that you can call on to pray with, and they will pray for you, you can know you will be safe and secure against the storms that are blowing in our day. It's important. Church is also where, finally, here the last one, we become part of something massive. This gathering is not just man's idea. This was not just someone's good idea from back in the day. No, even here in Ovilla, when believers gathered and said, 
we are going to see a work of God here in this city. They were gathering based on the promises. They were gathering based on the calling upon us as believers to go, therefore, into all nations and make disciples. This is our responsibility. And so when you become a part of a healthy church, you should be looking. What are they doing to further the gospel beyond their own walls? What is happening outside of this? Because the church is called to have a vision that is not just to the five more miles around them, but to the ends of the earth. There ought to be a vision big enough that says, we exist to change the ever-loving culture. We exist to bring the gospel to people who are desperately in need. We exist to push back the darkness in this world and see the light of the hope of Jesus save people, redeem people, heal people, restore broken relationships, and change this planet. This is what you and I are called to. And you can't get that anywhere else. You might walk into your place of employment and they've got a mission statement on the wall and you think, I'm so glad I work here. That is the... That is minor compared to what the vision is that Jesus has given us as a church. To go absolutely global with the message of the gospel and see real lives change, yes, that is our calling. And you want to be a part of something big, then you get engaged and involved in a local church. Now, I'll just address the elephant in the room. Because I know everybody in here at some point has been hurt in a local church. And you're thinking, that all sounds nice and good. But you don't know what I've been through. I think I do. I'll be happy to hear your story. As long as you let me tell me my story. It's filled with bruises. It's filled with bumps. It's filled with broken relationships. It's filled with tears. But by God's grace, I will not let a hurt, a path of hurts, keep me from what I have been called to as a member of the body of Christ on this earth today. Amen? Look, my car has broken down before, but I did not say, that's it, I'm not driving a car anymore, I'm done. I'm going to walk from now on. That didn't happen. I've been hurt in relationships before, but it did not make me say, that's it. I'm done with people. I'm going to live the rest of my life in my bedroom and never come out. God help you if that's your case. Heather and I have had conflict in our marriage before, but it did not make us say, that's it. We're done. We're out. We're through. No. You turn to Jesus in the midst of those issues, and you find the healing and the restoration, and you move on. Hello? Hello? Because if, if Jesus is all in on the church, why wouldn't we be? If he died for the church, then we should say, I'm in for it. If Jesus is building the church, we should say, I'm in for it. If the church is the body of Jesus, we should say, I'm in it. If Jesus has promised that this is where his hand of protection is, then I want to be in on that. So I want to read to you a statement that sums up this thought. And I'm going to read it because I don't want to miss a word of what I'm intending here. If you have been hurt, burned, struggled being involved in church, as Vertical Church, we are aware that this healthy experience has not been the experience of every person who has been in a church. We recognize the skeptic, the cautious, and the wounded heart, we stand today to take back ground that has been stolen by the enemy, to rescue hearts that have lived in pain, and begin to restore the path for the church to once again stand in its power and its purpose for which it has been created in Jesus, whole, free, Powerful, secure, confident, gracious, truthful, and driven to take the message of the gospel to the world. 
This is our drive as Vertical Church. Amen? Will you join me in that? Amen? This is as real as it gets. And I want us to be real with God, with one another, and for that reality to walk out of this space into your house. I'm convinced when it does, when all three of those are operating in just genuineness, revival will fall on this land. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you desire truth in the inward parts. You desire sincerity. You desire wholeness. You desire honesty. And you've come to free us from pretending and putting on. You've called us to live a life that is genuine and sincere in love for you and love for one another. I thank you for the church. I thank you that you have called us and placed us in it. And you've called us to take this message of, of your gospel to the world now. So we are grateful today. Thank you for what you're teaching us. Thank you for how you are leading and growing this church. We stand to give you all glory and praise for that today. In Jesus' name, amen.